Well, hi again, everyone. Welcome to the Vine Church. Thanks so much for joining us today. This is our digital service for November 1st. We invite you to join us this fall here at the Vine. We meet in person at 3950 Leonard Street in Grand Rapids. Wonderful worship, great teaching and sermons from Pastor Jim and great experience for the family. So we invite you out. Uh, 10.30 a.m. is our service. We have nursery, we have children's church, and we have COVID safety protocols in place. Today we're gonna sing Raise a Hallelujah and King of My Heart. This is Psalm 145 as a call to worship. I will exalt you, my God the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They tell of the power of your awesome works, and I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness.
the king of my heart Be the mountain where I run The fountain I drink from Oh, he is my song Let the king of my heart Be the shadow where I hide The ransom for my life Oh, he is my song You are Father, um, just so grateful to be in your presence today and that you don't leave us wondering about your love or your will for our lives. Lord, you've given us your word. Um, pray that you would open our hearts by the power of your Holy Spirit and help us to um, receive it, to receive you as our Savior and our leader. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, um, oops. as um, I told you, today is about citizenship, and it reminded me of a, of a joke. So there were a bunch of politicians, and they were on a country road, and the bus that they were in ran off the road and uh, ended up in a farmer's field. So the old farmer who owned the property came and investigated, and then he proceeded to dig a hole and bury all the politicians that were on the bus in the hole. A few days later, a sheriff showed up and, and saw the crashed bus, and he asked the old farmer where all the people had gone. Where were the politicians? 
And the old, uh, the old farmer said, well, I buried them. <laughs> and the sheriff asked the old farmer, well, were they all dead? And the farmer replied, well, some of them said they weren't, but you know how politicians lie. <laughs> but boom, boom. <laughs> Not all politicians lie. But I know when we um, talk about citizenship and uh, a message where we're talking about what's our role right now as citizens in this, this country of the people, by the people, and for the people, I think it's, I think it's easy for us to roll our eyes. Yeah, we're kind of sick of it, right? I think we really are. And um, all God's people struggle with this. So of people that would say that they're believers in Jesus as their Savior and Lord, only about one in four vote. Only about one in four. And, and you know, I'm sure that a lot of that is, well, you know, um, I just can't go one way or the other. I just, I don't know what to do. But is that the right attitude? You know, in, in, in our country, in the United States, where it's of the people, by the people, for the people, is it not voting a vote too? It is. Not voting is a vote. That's the way it works. And you know, in our text today, if this is informative, um, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So now, what does that mean? It's so hard. And as Christ followers, we, we find ourselves in this tug of war, right? So on the one hand, we are members of God's kingdom. We're just his. We're forgiven, and we're free, and we're followers of Jesus. Okay, and, and, I mean, I think people get to this point as they discover who Jesus is and they learn more about their Savior who came to this earth. Our risen Lord, Jesus, taught with this book. When he did his teaching, he was always teaching out of the Bible. He told us that God's word was trustworthy and true. And then he also said he was God. So they would think he was crazy for saying he's God. In our day, people think he's crazy for saying you can trust this word and teaching out of it. And guess what? The crazy man isn't crazy because he actually rose from the dead after he said he was God and he said you could trust the word. His word is true and it's trustworthy. And I think as followers of Christ, we get to the point where as we grow in our relationship with him, as we walk with Jesus, he teaches us, you really can trust this book. It is, it is inspired by the Holy Spirit. It isn't legend. It isn't myth. We can trust it. Um, and so when we learn that, we're like, oh, man, now what do we do? Because we find ourselves in a tug of war, right? And it's a tug of war because of the way things are aligned in our United States, right? I can just say it. Democrat and Republican, they're the main parties, right? And, and we know that these two parties, and there's other ones, there's Libertarian and there's Green, but um, they, you know, we know because of just the way the numbers work, they don't fare very well. <clears throat> and so we find ourselves in a tug of war, right? And the tug of war is this, like one party, Democrats, they are, uh, at least on their platform, they will be all out for racial justice. Is Jesus for racial justice? Oh, come on. All out. We are all made in the image of God, and the Bible is all about that. How about the poor and marginalized? Is Jesus for the poor and marginalized? All the time. All the time. As a matter of fact, those are his people. When he came to earth as a human, he, did, he wasn't born in a king's house. He wasn't born in a castle. He was born to peasants, poor people, okay? And he can identify with the poor and marginalized. The Bible says he didn't have a place to lay his head. He can identify. And, and the scripture's all about that. He, it is. And then sanctity of life. Scripture, so clearly, 
life begins at conception. Behold, I was knit together by God in my mother's womb. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Psalm 139. Can't deny that. And end of life. God gives life, and only God has the right to take it. And our job is to be his caregivers on earth. We're seeing things all around the earth where they're taking the life of um, people that are uh, medically fragile and people that are elderly. They're, they're taking their life. They're not just caring for them and letting them die. They're taking their life. That is wrong biblically, right? Okay, so, uh, you know, obviously, in, 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 if we're going to the booth, the Republicans, their platform aligns with sanctity of life. <clears throat> and then sexuality and marriage, the, the, you know, Jesus was clear about that all over in Scripture. We, 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 we just looked at a bunch of those passages in the weeks past. Jesus never, he, he never, ever stepped back from speaking the truth to someone, but he did it with such love that they were drawn to him and he forgave and he gives new beginnings and it's all about that. But we can see how we're stuck in this polarized world. Like, what do we do with that? What does it mean to be a person of the kingdom of God, a follower of Jesus, and a good citizen? How do we do that? And loving, how do we do that? That is so hard. And so today, we just want to review this, all right? I'm, don't worry. Don't worry. Like, stop right now. Okay. Put down the shields. And I'm not going to tell anybody who to vote for <laughs> at all. Because Jesus did. Jesus isn't Republican. Jesus isn't Democrat. Jesus is Jesus, all right? And we're citizens of the kingdom of heaven, and we're ambassadors on earth. So what is our job? All right? And so we're going to look at the roles of the kingdom. And the, and the again, I did an outline because there's going to be a lot of information here. The roles of the kingdom, the relationship of the kingdom, and the responsibility of the kingdom. <coughs> and so, um, <clears throat> first of all, I want to look at the roles of the kingdom. Um, our scripture today shows us like two very different kingdoms, all right, with a radically different identity, all right? And so let's just do these really quick. On the one hand, there's God's kingdom, where you, as a believer in Jesus, are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. On the other hand, there's the kingdom of the world, which if they're not, if they haven't repented and believed in Jesus, they are not a people. They have not received God's mercy. Now, God acknowledges nations, ethnos, ethnicities. But here, he, he's talking about in relationship to him. He goes on, again, uh, on the one hand, God's kingdom, your beloved, your strangers, your resident aliens, um, you're abstaining from passions that war against your soul. That's us. That's what Peter just told us in 1 Peter 2. And on the other hand, there's the, the, the Gentiles. Um, and those Gentiles sometimes are going to speak against you as evildoers because, of, because we follow Jesus. It's going to happen, all right? Um, look at my page here. One more. On the one hand, you're to be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. Emperor, governors, sent by God to punish those who do evil. Um, you're free, but you're to live as servants of God on this earth. Um, free, but you're a servant. And then on the other hand, oops, I didn't put that up for you, sorry. You can see it now. Human institutions, emperor, governors, um, they see God's people doing good, um, and they kind of call us names and say bad things, but they're ignorant and foolish. They, they don't know Jesus yet. They don't have the Holy Spirit yet. Okay, so what do we do? So you can see here, there's two distinct 
kind of realms, two kingdoms. But yet, even one of our kids could ask us this simple question, right? Isn't God the king of everything? Of course he is. All right, when we're talking about two kingdoms, we're talking about how God rules to the lands of his kingdom. It's, it's really the roles of the kingdom that God rules, all right? And so the first role, I'm going to kind of just draw a really simple picture. So we're going to be clear that God is king of all. God's just he's king. He rules. If, if you're uptight and you're like, oh, man, I don't know where this is all going to end, read Psalm 2 today. God looks at the kingdoms and the kings and the governments and they think they're in charge and the Bible says God laughs. Because he's having his way. He's having his way. How does he have his way? Well, um, first of all, the role of kind of like the kingdom of this world. For us, we're in the United States of America and so there's government, all right? And so I'm gonna just put some people down here. You can picture in your mind for us this is the US but for um, you know other places Russia China they have government too and um, ordinarily God rules normally over all indirectly through government and laws right and so um, in the beginning, it didn't have to be this way. Government and laws. In the beginning, before the fall, we didn't need that. And um, uh, we just knew God's will and we did it. We loved God perfect. We loved neighbor perfect. There, there wasn't all this selfishness and pride and revenge and all this stuff that um, gets us in trouble in our day. But now there is. And so God established government and laws. And that's how he ordinarily rules. He, he doesn't ordinarily zap people when they're doing wrong. He puts handcuffs on them and sends them to prison, right? He keeps order. And the whole purpose is to preserve man. So one of the places that we look to, so like where did God establish this, is after the flood, Genesis 9, 6, God says, man is made in my image. He's made in my image. All people everywhere, and I'm going to protect them. So if someone sheds blood, his blood shall also be shed. And that we say is this rule of law. Okay? God, uh, government, laws. Um, and it's rule. And, and that's what Peter says in our text today. So I have a, a little picture. It's the same one I have on the screen. But look at what Peter says. 1 Peter 2, 3. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. This is, guys, this is Peter. If you know scripture, you know about Peter, one of the disciples, one of the twelve. And Peter thought Jesus was coming to set up an earthly kingdom where the Messiah King that God promised through the ages would rule and people would finally have to obey God's laws and they would have to do what he said. All right? And you remember when the people came to apprehend Jesus, it's the night before he goes to the cross, Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, and the soldiers, the Roman soldiers and the uh, temple guard come to get Jesus, and, and what does Peter do? He takes his sword and he whacks off an ear. <laughs> and Jesus says, stop and put your sword away, because God has said, whoever lives by the sword shall die by the sword, a different room. And Jesus said, don't you know that I can call 10 legions of angels if I wanted? If I wanted to rule by law this way, I could do that. Snap of my finger. 
but it's not the way Jesus chose to rule. So, so, what does this mean? This is how God rules all things, keeps order. His purpose is to preserve man made in his image. So how does God rule? How does God rule this kingdom, the kingdom of God? Okay? He tells us, obey these guys, so there's order. But how does he rule us? Well, listen to what Jesus says. Jesus said these words, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is. Behold, the kingdom of God is within you. It's in you. It's your heart. It's you. And, and what does that mean? Well, Jesus teaches us that's, that's about the gospel. That's about a relationship. Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. And so how does God rule? He, he comes to an individual and he says, I love you. I made you. I rule all things. I want to bring you into my fold. But you're a sinner. How are you gonna, how are you gonna relate to me? I'm gonna send my son. He's gonna die for your sins, wash you clean, and rise in victory. So just say you're sorry, confess your sins, repent, and trust me. Believe in me. And that's how Jesus rules. He rules on the, the throne of people's hearts. Okay? And and so uh, he rules through. I think I can put a picture up here. All right. There we go. God rules people of the kingdom of God directly through the gospel, his word, and indwelling of his Holy Spirit. And so here, all right, through the the gospel, through his word, gospel, the good news that Jesus died and rose in victory, that he's our Savior and he's our Lord. He rules in grace and truth, and we believe him. We, we, we want to hear his word, right? His word. I think um, this picture is probably easier for you to understand. And so, when we look at this, I, I gotta tell you, it's so vital that we keep this straight. Vital, all right? And here's why, here's why. You see, when, when we make people like believe in Jesus, that's all wrong. It's not what Jesus intended. Over here, this is all about this. It's all about have to. All about that. You, you, why do you go the speed limit, or at least uh, uh, within 10 miles an hour of it? Because you have to. If you don't go the speed limit, you're getting a ticket, right? Oh. Why? Do we do what we do over here? Because we want to. I don't deserve it, but God saved me by his grace, his mercy in Christ. He, forget, he sent his son, his only son into the world to be my savior. I don't deserve that. I, I try as hard as I can, but I fall short every day, all day. And he loves, and he forgives, and I want to serve that king. I want to. And that is why we do what we do over here. You see, the things in the past that were just these horrible black eyes on Jesus' church, the Crusades, the Inquisition, what was that all about? Have to. Kneel or die. Confess or die. Friends, Jesus would never do that. Ever. That is not our Jesus. Okay? And so... 
um, we get things thrown at us like this. Isn't, isn't America a Christian nation? Friends, we are a nation that were established by Christians. Pilgrims came here so they could have religious freedom, but their whole idea was actually to preserve this, that people could have freedom to receive Christ or not. To receive his truth or not. Um, and the other one, now this question, isn't there supposed to then be a separation of church and state? Well, the separation of state and church is good, but listen, are you as an individual separated from church and state? No, we're, I am a citizen of the United States of America, of the people, by the people, for the people, and I, by God's grace, am a born again, believing citizen of the kingdom of heaven. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's son, that he came, that he died for me, that he rose in victory, and Friends, that he's alive and with us, and he will come again. I am his, all his, and I follow him as Lord and leader. So what do we do? And this is the next one, the relationship. So we saw the role. Here's the relationship. So, so what is our role? See, uh, God rules what we call mediately. Media is he uses the medium of government to keep peace and preserve people. But he rules me immediately. By the power of his Holy Spirit resident in me. He rules me immediately in a relationship with Jesus Christ where he speaks to me through that spirit and grace and truth, his word. Okay? So how is the world going to meet him and meet what, what you know Jesus believes we should do? through us, right? It is through us. We are the bearers of the gospel, the good news, grace and truth, all this, God's word, grace, truth, word, ultimately what? Jesus. Jesus. Guys, here's the deal. What is this all about? What is this all about? In Titus or in Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 through 6, we read this. First then, I urge that supplication and prayers and intercessions and thanksgiving be made for all people for kings and all in high positions. So we're supposed to pray for our leaders, this government leadership, right? Why? That we may lead peaceful and quiet life. God wants us to have a good life, okay? Godly and dignified in every way. Why? Why? What is the why? This is good and it pleasing in God's in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Why, why is God preserving this right now? Isn't it so broken? Do you, have you felt the brokenness of our world lately? I, I, had, I have two dear friends that have, I have shepherded before as their pastor. One of them this week, her daughter, she's my age, her daughter was killed in a car accident. <clears throat> We're still praying, begging God for the son-in-law and the two children to be healed. It's so broken. Another uh, dear, dear friend, his son was hurt in a construction accident. His, his head got crushed. Such a broken, broken world. How long? <clears throat> that place where there's no more brokenness, there's no more of this unpeace, there's no more political ads. None of it. It's just peace. And why is it so important this is preserved? So that people can hear the good news about Jesus. And not be forced into it, but, but that it's held out to them. 
that there's this invitation from God that he reconciled the world to himself in Christ. All these people in these neighborhoods around this church are paid for already with the blood of Jesus Christ. Already done. It is finished. And they don't know. And they don't know the beauty of a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's why we're here. <clears throat> that's why we're here. So, so in the meantime, like what's our role now? Responsibility. So we did roles, we did relationship, and now responsibility. All right. First, be humble. Guys, when people hear this word, evangelicals, what do they think? They don't always think humility. <coughs> they think people that are forcing the Bible down their throat, right? Guys, we still need to speak the truth. We're the bearers of it, but we need to do it in relationship. And the Bible says right after this, in 1 Peter 3, it says that always be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks you for the hope that you have, but do so with gentleness <clears throat> and respect. Every single person you lock eyes with is made in the image of God. We're all broken. Guys, how are you saved? How are you saved to this day? By grace. You don't deserve it. Not one of you here deserves to be saved. And don't you love that? Because it doesn't depend on you. It depends on God. And what he did for us in Christ. I love that. Second, be submitted, all right? We, 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 we need to submit to governing authorities, like Peter said, but you got to understand. So Peter, he's the one, like he calls us to submit, and he's the one that in the garden took out the sword. He learned from Jesus to submit because that's the best way to keep this safe so that people can, you know, be preserved, so they can hear the good news and receive it willingly, not by force, Okay? But you have to understand, this is, Peter wrote these words, 1 Peter, during the time of Nero, the emperor. And this is early in Nero's reign, towards the end of Nero's reign, what happens to Peter? He gets crucified on a cross upside down. Why? Because he won't say that Nero is a god. He won't recant from saying, Jesus is true God who came from the Father to save the world, and he is the only way to be saved. And so they tacked him to a cross and crucified him upside down. Peter learned, you gotta, you, you, you know, we submit to governing authorities, but when the governing authorities tell us to go against what God says, then we must obey God rather than men. Submit to God. So that, be submitted, be active politically. <laughs> All right? Yep, in our nation, of the people, by the people, and for the people. You may have voted already. Some of us are going to go from Tuesday. Are you supposed to be this? Or is it supposed to be this? Yeah. All right, it's this, right? <laughs> We're ambassadors. Our citizenship is in heaven. When we go to the, this is hard, I can't tell you, because I told you, it's just like, we're ripped. But you need to go in the Holy Spirit, understand who you're voting for, so you're doing it with a, with a good conscience, or at least, Luther said, sin boldly. You're doing the best you can, but ultimately understanding we're covered in the blood of Jesus Christ. That isn't an excuse for evil. not worry that it's not good enough. Right? And then be evangelical. I want you to see the little e. That's our word. That's a Bible word. The first time we see it in scripture is um, in, in Jesus' life is at the announcement of his birth. And the angel said, today is born for you in the city of David a Savior. He is Christ the Lord. And when the angel announced that, he said, fear not. For I bring you good news. Who and Delia. 
And guys, we need to be that above all things. We need to be good news. When people see you coming, your friends, let it be good news. It doesn't mean you're not going to challenge them. It doesn't mean you're not going to um, speak the truth in love. But it means that you're going to ultimately, this is going to prevail. There is a Savior who loves that individual no matter what they are doing, no matter where they are at, no matter what political party they are. There is a Savior who loves them and wants to walk with them in grace and truth. I invite the praise team forward. It's really important to Jesus today that you're not living over here. I have to. I'm being good enough. I'm going to church, I'm doing my prayers, I'm doing my Bible reading. I'm trying to be a good person. I hope I'm good enough. It's really important that you're living over here. You're living in God's love and his forgiveness. You could never be good enough for God. And you don't have to be because he came in the goodness of his son. He did what you came. He lived perfect for you. And then he died for all your sins on the cross. He rose in victory. You're free. You're forgiven. And God just wants us to live with this may he want to. Declaring the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Please rise and pray with me.